Okay, everybody, here we are with day 10 of math history content. And um, I believe that last time we wrapped up our conversation about Al Khwarizmi. We are talking about the Arab nations and their effect on our math history today. And next on our list is Omar Khayyam, and it's K H A Y Y. A.M. Kayam. That's Omar Kayam. His dates are 1048 to 1123. And he lived in what would today be Iran. Okay. So just as a tiny bit of a reminder, we've been looking on our map here. <laughs> okay. Hopefully you know all about the Egyptians and the Babylonians, the Romans and the Greeks. And we're in the Arabian Peninsula now, okay? We did a little bit of work with the Turks up here around Constantinople, and we'll talk about them a little bit more, I think, today as we move forward. Um, we have Mecca here because that's the birthplace of Muhammad, and then Jerusalem, which turned into a religious location for both actually Muslims and for um, Catholics, so this is, Jerusalem's actually going to end up being a point of contention, and I think in the last day or two of class, we've added Baghdad, which is right here. It's actually, I think, on the Tigris River, so it might be on the right-hand river, not the left-hand, but anyway, it's right in here in this area. So Iran is, modern-day Iran is also in this area. I, I mean, we've got Baghdad right here, right? So, um, so that's where we're talking about this guy what happened what's happening at this time is that there's a remember that the caliphs are kind of like the governors of the different state areas if you will of the muslim um well it's a religion and it's kind of a political force right so there's lots of caliphs in and out and there's a lot of turmoil and a lot of let's say infighting going on starting to go on um, at some point, right about now, what we're going to see is the Turks overthrow Constantinople. So if we remember, when we were talking about the Roman Empire, Constantinople, um, Constantine was one of the emperors. He was the emperor of Eastern, the Eastern Roman Empire, and... Um, so this is a Catholic area, right? It's Christianity is the major religion for these people. And so they're being overthrown. It was around 1094 by the Turks. And this is actually going to be one of the beginning things that, that really leads to conflict between the Christian and the Muslim religions. And so these are going to actually eventually, this will lead to what we know as the Christian Crusades. Christian Crusades. So, um, as we talk about that a tiny bit, well, what we're going to see is there's a lot of math that's actually kind of growing up in and around these violent times. And from Omar Khayyam, one of the major things that he did for us is made contributions to the calendar. And you're thinking, oh my goodness, are we still working on the calendar? We've been talking about the calendar for, you know, thousands of years now. It started 3000 BC as far as we know. And here we are, 1048 and beyond AD, and we're still working on the calendar. And the, the truth is, I believe it's now called the Gregorian calendar. Um, the Julian calendar um, was the one that we were using. And the Gregorian calendar actually has us insert eight what they call leap years in 33 years. Okay, so we get a leap day. In fact, this is one year when we will get it. This, this month, at the end of uh, February, we will have a leap year. Okay, a leap day, and then we get February 29th. So, um, one, if you, you, you do the math on this, that's 8 out of 33, and that's approximately one in every four years, right? And that's when we add um, 
our leap years in there. It's every year that's divisible by four. So for instance, if we are in the year 2020, 20 is divisible by four. So therefore, um, we're going to have a leap year. All right. So um, yeah, eight, eight leap years in 33 years. And what happened was that Omar Khayyam could tell, look, we've got a pretty good calendar going on here. We just don't have it exact. Like it's not always happening that the solar, um, the sun's in the same spot um, for the solstice or for the equinox or whatever. It's just not quite happening on the same days and things like that. So he was trying to um, even it out a little bit and make sure that we had um, adjusted for everything. So he threw in the leap years. We can thank Omar Khayyam for that and um, said this is a better representation. And if you look at that, it, that's every 33 years. So we're actually only getting um, four in 32 years, right? So there's an extra year in there. So every once in a while, we actually are falling short even more. So there is a spot where every once in a while, the calendar will correct itself and add a day in, even not in the leap year. So that's an interesting little thing to worry about. Okay, Omar Khayyam, he thought of algebra as an art form. So that's interesting to us. He thought there was a particular process that you could follow through. And in fact, he put out what were the beginnings of what we now call the modern day scientific notation. I'm sorry, scientific method. Um, my brain wandered for a minute. Scientific method. So if you were in science, you would know um, there are certain ways of doing things, and he is the forefront, the forerunner, I guess you would say, for, for getting to that process. Um, in his works, he refers to Euclid, oh my goodness, and he refers to Apollonius's conics. And so, uh, you know, it's very, very interesting to see him referring back to the Greek works because we know that a lot of that um, geometry was, was fundamental here in, in helping to develop the algebra. So what he wanted to do was he wanted to, well, first of all, he classified things in different types of problems. And I'll show you an example of that in a second different types of problems. So for instance, he would be working on something called the cubic. Okay, so he wanted to solve the cubic. Well, a cubic is like a quadratic equation, has an x squared in it. This would be of the form ax squared plus bx plus c. I'm sorry, <laughs> that's, the, that's the quadratic, okay. That's the standard form, right? Ours would be ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d equals zero. That would be what the cubic looks like. So it kind of lines up with quadratic, and while um, we see that al Khwarizmi was working on the quadratic and figuring out how to complete squares and things like that, which will eventually lead us to the quadratic formula, and something that will always work for solving a quadratic in, as long as it's we have coefficients, A, B, and C. Kayam wanted something similar for cubics, um, but whenever he started doing that, he realized pretty quickly, as many of us will probably realize, look, this is really complicated. <laughs> there are four different coefficients in here, three different spots where I can add and subtract into my cubic. So the, the basic cubic's just AX cubed, right? but I can add and subtract. And if you've played around with some of this stuff, you know, like if I add big numbers or subtract big numbers, this is gonna end up having a graph that is just kind of bouncing all over the place, right? The more crazy my numbers get, the more out there a lot of times this, this graph ends up. So he was like, hey, th this can be very complicated. I can't do all of this. Perhaps I will classify it into types. So for instance, in order for it to be a cubic, it has to have the first term, 
but it doesn't have to have any of the other terms. So it has to have an x cubed in there, right? But it doesn't have to have any of the other terms. And if you know from your, say, algebraic days, um, if I'm looking at this guy, actually I could factor out an x, right? Factor out the x, and then I could set this x equals zero, and then I can set this quadratic equal to zero, and then we have something that we have a solution for. So he was trying, that's what I mean by classifying problems by type. He was trying to say, hey, if you have something in this format, you can solve it this way. If you have something in that format, you can solve it that way. And he was trying to get like uh, different situations going, right? Because that's going to be different than, for instance, say, ax cubed plus bx squared equals zero. If I can drop out the cx and the d term, then that's a different case, right? So like we would call this type one, and this is a different type. Okay, so he was kind of characterizing things and seeing what they have in common, and if they will solve in similar ways, that's what he wanted to know. Um, so what happened is that he actually does solve the cubic. We give him credit for the first to solve the cubic ever. However, his solution is geometric, not algebraic. So it's not a generic court or a generic um, solution, right? The generic stuff's going to come in whenever I have something like the quadratic formula is a very generic formula that will work to solve quadratics. So he doesn't have something like that. Instead, he's doing geometrically with the graph, and basically what he's ending up doing is kind of constructing a solution. So um, it takes a while to do. It's not pretty. <laughs> and it's very specific to certain types of geometric. Um, so the idea being like this, if I have a cubic, let's say I have an XY T chart, and I wanna solve that thing, well, we know that if it looks like this, it's got three solutions, right? Okay. That can be very difficult to work with if I'm trying to solve it geometrically, right? It's actually even difficult to work with if I'm trying to solve it, al solve it algebraically. Modern days, we have methods for dealing with that. And in fact, later on, when we get further into Europe, we're going to have something that we'll call, not too far from now, probably after um, a couple of weeks, we'll have something that we call the cubic controversy. And it's one of the, the big situations in our, in our class where we're like, hey, you know, who gets the credit, basically? There's a controversy over it. We don't have to worry about who's the first to solve. We know that Kayam gets the credit for that. But his stuff is kind of more specific situations. So, for instance, when you look at the types of questions that he's solving, he's probably solving something more like this. Okay. Now that's still a cubic, right? But it's a different type of problem. And when I'm talking solutions here, I mean real. There's still three solutions in here, but what about it? You see how it's not going back through the number line, right? The real number line. So what's happening is it's got two solutions up here and those are imaginary solutions, right? We can tell where it's starting to do its changes and stuff. So what we have is only one real solution. One real solution, that's all we got. So um, that type right there is a little bit easier maybe to solve because maybe I'm dealing with something more like this situation right here um, and then I'm gonna figure it out, right? So, so that's what he was doing with the types. Um, in particular, also an interesting point about him is that his solutions were non-negative. Just like the solutions for um, al Khwarizmi were non-negative whenever we took the completing the square and we took the square root of, I think it was 64 the other day, um, we didn't worry about the negative 8, right? Because we know, modern days, negative 8 times negative 8 is 64. But we didn't care about it when we were al Khwarizmi because why? He's dealing with a geometric shape, and so he wants positive solutions because it doesn't mean anything if the length of my square is negative 8, right? That doesn't mean anything 
to me, um, physically speaking. So same kind of things going on here. Um, Al Khwarizmi, or I'm sorry, Omar Khayyam is really worried about non-negative solutions. So uh, that's one of the things that he was looking at. There you go. So again, that would be over on this side of, of the graph. All right. So those are really the only two um, Arab mathematicians that we're going to look at that we're gonna give name to. There were others, of course, but those are the two who really gave some, some major contributions to us. So for Kayyem, we should know he used he did work on the calendar, and we should know that um, he also was the first to solve a cubic, even if it was geometrically. Okay. So, um, I believe we're in chapter six in your book by now. Movement to Europe. This is going to be um, getting away a bit from, I'm pulling up my map again, getting away a bit from the area around the Mediterranean Sea. There will still be some people we'll talk about. In fact, the first one that we're going to talk about is going to be in Italy. So, um, the first mathematician we're going to talk about. So, he'll be in there, and we'll have different ones in that area. But we're going to move more into all of Europe now. We're going to have some stuff in Germany, and maybe some people in Spain and France. And we're going to have some people up there on those islands in England. So, um, when they say movement to Europe, the idea is kind of... We're not so centered around the Mediterranean is what we've been doing. Because if we remember, kind of our point here is to tie it to our modern day mathematics, all this historical stuff, why are we doing it? Well, hopefully we have um, an appreciation for how easy we have it nowadays. Just seeing how we have numeric or Arabic numbers now, right? Instead of Roman numerals, for instance. Okay, so we can do square root of a number very quickly whereas we wouldn't have been able to do that if we were still using Greek numerals or Roman, Roman numerals. So these guys had it tough back here right around, right around the Mediterranean Sea. And we're eventually going to move into North America. This is where we are, modern days. Most of us are in America doing our study of this class. Um, and our ties are very close to Europe, right? So there's a lot of people who migrate to America who are from... Um, you know, Wales and Scotland and, and Germany and England and places like that. So that's how we're trying to tie in. And, and not just with American mathematics, but mostly, it, I would say, Western mathematics, because that's, that's the study that we want to get to. We want to get through calculus for sure. And uh, in order to do that, we have to be in Europe, okay, because Europe was discovered, <laughs> so to speak, in Europe. So that's where we're headed. Okay, so what do we know going into Europe? We know that Christianity became the sponsored religion of uh, the Roman Empire. That's what we know. We know that... Um, we, we just saw a second ago here with Omar Khayyam that in 1094, so during Omar Khayyam's lifetime, the Turks overthrew Constantinople. Well, until now, it's run by the Roman Empire, and it's Christian, right? Or Catholic, if you want to be really specific. We know that the other half of the Roman Empire is run from Italy, right? So it's quite a distance away, and um, there's... There's going to be a lot of infighting, so to speak, between the two religions that we're looking at here. Okay, we know that the church began to have um, political pull, political dealings, I guess you would say. In fact, if you were going to be a king or even a lord, a lot of times um, you would need to be ordained. Okay, so what does that mean, ordained? It means that the church sanctioned you, the church blessed you, right? So um, this is a big influence on government. Now, if you're in America, modern days, 
you're like, oh, America was founded with the concept of not having a state-sponsored religion, right? So this is a little bit different. But um, back in the day in Europe, there were state-sponsored religions, and there were religions that sponsored states, quite frankly. <laughs> so um, they, had, they had influence on the government, for sure. Okay. What we know is that we have Augustine somewhere in the background um, who has linked Christianity and philosophy. Can't write today. Seems like I can never write. Christianity and philosophy and math all together linked in a bit of um, the beginnings, you might say, of modern day um, liberal arts studying. Okay, um, It's interesting because at some point, they have a spiritual element. Ah, spiritual element to numbers. Which is interesting, right? For instance, um, if you are a Christian, you might know that in the Bible, there is the belief that the number seven is the number of completion, or sometimes people might say the number of foundation, right? So uh, seven being the number of completion because according to the Bible, it took seven days to, well, six days to build the earth and all of its inhabitants. And on the seventh day, God rested because it was complete. So that's kind of the idea that seven has, the number seven has a particular uh, meaning to it. Okay. So North Africa was part of the Roman Empire. We have Alexandria in there. And because we have still a bit of that kind of thing going on, there's a lot of studying of the nature. Studied nature. Okay. So um, at some point, though, what we're going to see is the late thousands, oh, thousands to 1200s, and the dates vary depending on who you're talking to and where you look at. The number that I have is 1095 to 1291, okay? But um, depending on which source you're talking about, which book you're looking at, that's one of the problems with history that's a little less well-documented, right? Um, but at this point, we have something that becomes called the Crusades, right? Christian Crusades. And what happens is that um, in 1095, Pope Urban II dispatched people, troops, um, knights, warriors, however you want to think about it, um, to help stop Muslim aggression is what they said. Stop Muslim aggression. And we know whenever we studied Muhammad, maybe a week or so ago, a couple of lessons back, that after Muhammad had passed away, that there was this thing called the armies of Islam and that they were trying to spread um, the belief in Islam and to make conversion, so to speak. And so there was some aggression going on. However, um, you can't always believe the first, the first reason that's thrown at you, right? Okay, so um, while they said, okay, we're going to stop the Muslim ag aggression, you also have to think about a few other things that were going on in the area. So for instance... Um, there's a lot going on about trading rights in the Mediterranean, right? So think about it. We've already talked, we mentioned in an earlier class period. Okay, here's Mecca. We've got this strait that's leading us up to the Mediterranean Sea. Here's Mecca. Here's Jerusalem right on the edge of the Mediterranean Sea. And this Mediterranean Sea is kind of a tranquil area that I can get to all of these areas um, without having to go around Africa in order to get up here to Europe, right? 
So um, if all of this is controlled by the Muslims, and if the Christians, the Romans, are trying to um, be able to exert themselves and be able to control some areas, then these areas right here might be a bit of a bone of contention, right? We might not want the Muslims to be controlling that. So um, there's trading rights in the Mediterranean at stake, so that's something. There is this fracture that's going on in the church because we have, um, we have had the Roman Eastern Empire and the Roman Western Empire. So perhaps if I can do something, um, if, if I can get everybody behind a cause, so to speak, if I'm the emperor, or the, the pope in this case, if I'm the Pope Urban II, and I can get everybody behind a cause um, to go fight the stop the Muslim aggression, you know, is the way they're saying it, then perhaps, you know, I can reunite the church a little bit. We also have to think about that we've been going through basically the, the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages, things like that, and we have these knights, K-N-I-G-H-T-S, actual knights, armor and stuff like that. I have these knights, and um, I've been training them. They've been jousting, and they've been doing different things, and um, all of a sudden, that kind of feudal system, if you will, is kind of coming to an end. We're moving more toward a state system, and um, we're not going to have as many little, little castles and little lords and ladies and things like that. And so these knights who are very aggressive and who have been practicing all their warrior skills, so to speak, um, kind of suddenly don't have anything to do with themselves. So, hey, look, I have a quest for you. Why don't you go fight on this crusade and go, you know, for, for God and country, that kind of thing. So the battle cry for them became, let's expel the Muslims from Jerusalem. And again, Jerusalem is up there. It's a key port, right? It's, it's a hub of, of trading activity and stuff like that. We know that. But we also know that um, Muhammad had set it up as one of the focal points in his religion. So it's significant to them. And we also know that it's a focal point in the Christian religion because this is where um, a lot of stories about Jesus are centered, right? And so both religions want to own, so to speak, Jerusalem. And so the Pope says, hey, go, go get those Muslims out of, of Jerusalem. It's very difficult, though, to say, hey, it's mine, it's not yours, or it's yours, it's not mine. Um, but that's what, was, that's what was kind of happening right there. Um, so, interesting stuff is going on. We're sending knights, sometimes from way up here in England, <laughs> right? They're way up here on the islands. They've got to come through Europe, probably across Italy, across the Mediterranean Sea, and all the way over here before they can even get to Jerusalem, right? That's a long trip, <laughs> especially when you're probably riding on a horse, okay? Now, you may leave your country in all your finery, riding on your steed with your lovely shiny armor. Um, but by the time you get over here, you know, it's going to take forever for you to just get over there. And by the time you do get there, you're probably sick and worn out from the trip and getting tired. And now you expect me to fight a battle. <laughs> you want me to be in war. Maybe I accomplish my goal. Maybe I die on the battlefield. Um, maybe if I win, okay, but I lost my horse and I lost my armor. So we've got a lot of warriors and, and knights and stuff that are over here in the Arabian Peninsula fighting for God and country, and they need to get back, <laughs> right? I want to go see my, my dad, my mom, my brother, whatever it is. And so I need to get back over here to England, okay? Even if I go through the Mediterranean, even if I come up through Italy, even if I go across Europe, that's going to take money right? That is going to take money. So, um, let me put here the Turks, just so we can see where the Turks are. 
Okay, Turks. They took over Constantinople. Okay, so that's going to take me some money to be able to get back over there. And what are the chances that on my own I brought that kind of cash with me or whatever, right? Those kinds of belongings that I could sell or pawn or whatever to get back. So what do all these people do? Of course, they take spoils of war, right? So if they um, have conquered an army and there are things there in that city or around about that we think we can get some money for or that we just feel like, hey, it's mine now because the owner doesn't want it or need it anymore. Um, I can twist their arm and take it from them, whatever the case may be. Um, I'm, I'm going to take some stuff with me so that maybe I can sell it and pawn it and get myself home along the way. So an interesting thing is that a byproduct of um, the Christian Crusades and all that bloody war, it's always the bloody war, right, um, is that they brought back mathematical methods and texts, T-E-X-T-S, from the Arabs. Okay, so um, we can see that because they bring back some Greek stuff. They bring back some al -Kharizmi. One of the books that gets translated into Latin, and we know that um, Latin becomes the language of the scholars, right? And if you're in Italy, in particular um, Rome, we've got, remember, we've got clergy that we're, we're educating Okay, um, and we want them to be able to translate stuff and to write things. And the language for the Christian um, religion, at least at that time, is probably Latin. Is probably what they're what the clergy are learning. Okay, so we translated stuff into Latin. For instance, al charisma had a, a lovely, not egotistical at all book. That was called the Astronomical Tables of Al Charisme. Yeah, that's not conceited at all. I'm not going to write out his whole entire last name again. So, um, what this is, is basically he has used what was called an astrolabe, which was a very generic, basic tool, and um, he's used that to record the motions, the motions of the planets, the moons, cycles of the moon, eclipses, all kinds of stuff. And what he's got is just tables and tables and tables of data. Which are going to be useful because people in Europe are interested in that kind of thing. So we'll see that that gets translated into Latin and then the scholars of that time um, in Europe, starting in Italy but moving on into Europe, the scholars are going to be able to use some of these types of books, types of books that they're bringing over, so that's awesome. All right, um, we know that from the Middle Ages, there was this curriculum that was being used. Um, and a lot of people will say this is the beginnings of even our modern day education system. So let me scoot this up. All right, so the curriculum that was being used was called, there were two parts to it. Um, one part is called the quadrivium. Q-U-A-D-R-I-V-I-U-M, where the quad part there, we're talking about like four of something. Okay, so we've got four of something, and the four of them are, there's arithmetic, which in general means math for us at this point in time, right? Um, there's music, 
which is interesting to us because modern days we would probably put music in with the arts, right? Not necessarily with the math and maths and sciences, um, but they did. They put it in with the math, geometry, and astronomy. So those four areas were areas of math and science. So for them, you had to study, you for sure had to study math and science. And the reason I've mentioned just a tiny bit, the reason why they felt like music should be considered part of the math and science area is because um, <laughs> we all know this is not necessarily true. Music has heart, music has soul. You have to feel it to be able to do a good job. But technically speaking, if you know numbers and you can read half numbers or half notes and whole notes and you can read the clef, um, you know, you can pay, pay attention to the tempo, you can do different chords and harmonies and things like that, which at this time are pretty much all number based, then you can make music. It may not be soulful music and we might not love it, but you can make music. So um, the idea there being that, well, it's, it's in there with the math and sciences because music is number based. And the other area is the trivium, T R I V I U M, trivium. And whenever I see that, I see the word try at the beginning of it, so I think three. So this area included grammar, which is just being able to speak appropriately, maybe write appropriately, rhetoric. Okay, which in general is kind of the ability to debate something. Um, we ask, even modern days, we'll ask rhetorical questions, right? Which means I don't necessarily want an answer. I just, I'm just throwing it out there for debate kind of thing, right? And logic. Which is interesting because um, they felt like these were more of the language skills, and the other ones were the math and science skills. And so they felt like logic was a language skill. And I think that if you talk to mathematicians and scientists today, that they'll say, oh, logic isn't a language skill. Logic is a math or a science skill. So it should be up in the quadrivium. So today's math or today's stuff is a little bit different. But all of these are a basis for what is now a modern day liberal arts education is what we call that. So in other words, if you have a bachelor of arts or a bachelor of science from an American university, you probably had to take what we call the core curriculum or um, the basics, right? A lot of people will call it that. And so you probably had to take a math and a couple of sciences and you probably had to take uh, some kind of music or art appreciation class, something like that. You had to take some literature classes, you had to take some English writing skills, things like that. And some people, depending on where you went to school, might have had to take a philosophy class or a debate class, a speech class, something like that. So all of those things are considered your basics or your core in a modern day liberal arts um, education. So there you go. All right. So hmm, that is kind of the background for what we're about to talk about going into um, going into Europe. And I want to, I'm looking to see, I want to talk about Fibonacci. He's my main person I want to get in today. And I feel like I'm looking at the timer on the, on the video. We're almost at 40 minutes. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to stop this video and um, I will come right back and start the next video. We'll, I'll even leave everything right here. We're just going to talk about our next guy um, or the first guy for us in Europe, Leonardo of Pisa, who we know as Fibonacci. And we'll talk about a little bit about his life and um, those kinds of things. His dates are 1175 through 1250. So I'll make a second video. I'll try to make sure I keep it within the hour and 15 minutes I normally try to keep it to. 
and I'll be right back.